Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Sana. I'm one of the providers from New Jersey, and I will be going through an evidence-based approach to cough targeted towards our urgent care setting. Um, so I have nothing to disclose. Um, so one of the reasons that I chose this topic is that, as everyone probably knows, cough is one of the most common presenting complaints, not only in our office setting, but pretty much worldwide um, in any medical setting. So this accounts for about 29.5 million outpatient visits, um, which is quite a lot, and probably one of the most common things that you will be seeing. So I hope this will be helpful for everyone, especially as, as we approach the winter. Um, so chronic cough in particular, which I'll be dedicating a portion of my lecture to, um, is actually fairly common. It affects five to 10% of children. Um, so it's, again, pretty prevalent compared to some of the other things that um, we see. Um, and again, why is this important and why do we want to talk about this today? Um, it actually causes, um, it, it's a causes significant burden to um, patients and their families, as probably a lot of us are aware, especially with increasing duration and severity. Um, so we definitely want to be mindful of um, what impact this has on patients and how we can do our best to approach it um, in an evidence-based and effective manner. Um, so in terms of some of the actual costs, um, most of them come from all the office visits that are incurred, um, as well as lab tests or imaging and um, medications, both over-the-counter and prescription. And in the US, um, actually $2 billion annually is spent just on over-the-counter cough medication. So you can imagine how much people are looking for a solution to this. Um, as well as something to think about is um, the quality of life that is impaired, um, especially with increasing duration of cough. As you can imagine, um, you know, cough prevents children, um, especially babies from sleeping at night, um, which keeps parents up. Um, it leads to school absences, um, work leave, um, a lot of different issues. So it's definitely something to consider. Um, and we also, um, some of us might be aware, but parents often seek recurrent consultation for cough. Um, usually until the cough is completely gone. So you may have multiple visits just for the same problem. So we definitely want to be aware of um, our, uh, how we can diagnose, right? How we can make the proper diagnosis, how we can do proper evaluation, as well as how to counsel families so that we can reduce some of this burden. So why is cough important? Um, I think this is something that I don't really think too much about, so this was a good reminder. Um, so cough is actually a really important reflex that protects the airway, which is one of the most important things we have, um, as well as maintains overall respiratory health. Um, in particular, cough enhances mucociliary clearance, so any particles or pollutants which can enter our airway. Um, this is especially important for anyone with chronic lung disease, um, especially for, I think a lot of us see a good number of patients with asthma, so this is something that we want to be mindful of. So um, one of the first things that we want to do when we approach cough is classify it. Um, so we'll go into a little bit more about what particular questions to ask to figure out what might be the underlying cause. But um, duration of symptoms is really important. Um, so the official definition of acute and chronic cough, and again, this is something that I think I only really set into stone when, when I was preparing for this, is um, acute cough is actually a duration of less than two weeks. Um, and we'll go through some of the etiologies for that. And chronic cough, um, so this is a definition that comes from um, a lot of different professional societies. Uh, in children less than or equal to 14 years old, um, the definition of chronic cough is actually a duration of greater than or equal to four weeks, so that's quite a long time. Um, we also wanna characterize the cough because um, the characteristics will actually lend a lot of information as to what the underlying etiology is. So you wanna make sure to differentiate whether it's wet or productive sounding or dry or non-productive. Um, and then you also want to determine how likely is it that we are going to identify an underlying etiology. Um, so we can also classify cough um, as specific, which um, is a cough that's associated with certain clinical features that suggests a clear underlying etiology. Um, so this would um, suggest any structural pathology or an acute illness. Um, and then there's nonspecific cough which we'll talk about later as well, um, which actually is not associated with any identifiable acute illness or disease or underlying pathology. And this can actually be one of the most frustrating complaints for both patients and providers. So we'll go through um, first acute cough. Again, this is a cough with a duration of less than two weeks. Um, so these, this is just an overview of some of the etiologies, um, probably a lot of them which we see. 
Um, I won't go through the management just because I think a lot of us are aware of how to manage this and especially straightforward cases. Um, but you have your upper and lower respiratory tract infections, um, both viral and bacterial. Um, and spasmodic group, I actually included in a separate category um, on purpose, just because this actually is a non-infectious um, etiology. Um, it's due to the sudden onset of non-inflammatory subglottic edema. So that's important to remember, especially when we see spasmodic group in our office, um, because um, it kind of it, de it determines how we counsel our patients. Uh, foreign body aspiration is another cause of acute cough that you definitely want to think about because this would require, this may require a little more emergent management um, as well as asthma. So I definitely wanted to harp in on um, viral upper respiratory tract infection. This is obviously one of the most common complaints seen worldwide as well as in our offices. Um, this is um, your most a common your most common cause of acute cough. So it's definitely something. Uh, we want to um, know how to manage as well as counsel patients on. Um, so this um, fact I actually tell patients quite a lot. So healthy children experience upper respiratory tract in infection several times a year. A lot of studies have shown up to six to eight episodes. So um, that's always a reassuring tidbit that I give parents when they come in saying that their children are always sick, especially if they're in daycare or school. And it's important to remember that the cough for this type of illness usually resolves within one to three weeks. Um, it can last up to three, um, which actually is important to remember. Um, and the cough usually is self-limiting, and you should see it improving towards the end. And we'll go into this a little bit more later. In terms of treatment, the mainstay is supportive care, as we all know. So antipyretics for any fever, um, ensuring oral hydration, rest. Um, and then we will talk about these. Um, in particular, what evidence there is surrounding um, any additional therapies. So uh, we see the use, or we see a lot of questions about over-the-counter cold or cough medications. Um, there are some alternative therapies which have been studied a little bit, um, including honey, uh, which I know we recommend in our offices. Um, and it's important to remember that antibiotics are not beneficial if the etiology is viral, and um, bronchodilators actually are not helpful either uh, if there's no accompanying asthma. Um, and then it's important to counsel parents about the natural history of these illnesses um, that, you know, again, cough can last up to three weeks, although we see it usually less than two, um, as well as counsel about warning signs that would require another consultation. Okay, so I have a little subsection within my lecture. It's called Coughing Controversy. This is um, actually Dr. Weinberg, <laughs> according to Dr. Weinberg. Um, so I'll be talking about a couple of things um, that you know, are fairly controversial topics or that we may not be sure exactly how to manage. And I'll go through some evidence-based strategies about how we can approach these things. So the first question is, are over-the-counter cough medications effective for acute cough? Um, so a 2014 Cochrane review um, actually reviewed the uh, or assessed the effects of oral over-the-counter cough preparations for acute cough in children and adults in the community setting. So this is all outpatient. Um, so these included randomized controlled trials um, comparing these cough medicines with placebo. They looked at all cough outcomes including frequency, duration, severity, um, as well as burden on quality of life. And they also looked at adverse effects of all of these preparations as a secondary outcome. Um, so this was a fairly large review. Um, they did have almost 30 studies in total, although um, 10 were in children and um, over 1,000 ch uh, children participants. And in the pediatric studies in particular, um, they found that these over-the-counter cough medicines were actually no more effective than placebo. And um, almost uh, quite a good proportion of the studies also reported significant adverse effects. So um, what the authors concluded is that um, there's really no good evidence for or against the effectiveness of cough medications, which is really important to remember because um, of all the potential harmful side effects. So if there's no well-studied or well-proven benefit, but there is a significant chance of adverse effects, uh, this really isn't something that we should be routinely recommending. Um, the next thing we can talk about is honey. So is honey effective for acute cough? So a Cochrane review was actually done both in 2014 and 2018. So the most recent one, um, it assessed the efficacy of honey for acute cough just in children in the outpatient setting. So again, these included randomized controlled trials that compared honey alone or in combination with antibiotics. 
um, with no treatment, placebo, um, honey-based cough syrup, or other over-the-counter cough preparations in children between 1 and 18 years of age. Um, so this was a fairly small study, and um, the quality of the evidence was actually low to moderate. So that's one of the limitations to keep in mind. Um, but there were almost 900 children enrolled. Um, so there wasn't, um, they used a seven-point Likert scale to uh, measure the degree of symptomatic relief that each of these treatments provided. And in the end, they concluded that there is no strong evidence for or against using honey. Again, a lot of these studies um, did have some limitations that um, impaired the quality of the evidence that they were able to collect. But they did find that honey is probably more effective than no treatment at all, placebo, um, diphenhydramine, and salbutamol, which is um, another um, cough preparation that is commonly used. Um, but it's not more effective than dextromethorphan. So um, basically, I think what they were trying to say is we don't have strong evidence and more research needs to be done, but you know, honey is likely to be more effective than not doing anything at all. Um, and it's something that I think uh, we can offer patients, especially when they're very frustrated and they feel like they have nothing else that they can do. So, Any questions on those two studies? So I also wanted to talk about pneumonia. Um, this is probably also another um, fairly common respiratory complaint that we see in our setting. Um, this can actually be a challenging diagnosis, and I've definitely come across this challenge myself when I see patients, um, because the presenting signs and symptoms can actually be very nonspecific. Um, they may be subtle, especially in infants and younger children who aren't able to verbalize or um, give you a good exam. So, um, and then the presentation can also vary, right, um, depending on the age, a responsible pathogen, as well as the severity of the infection or the stage at which you're seeing it. So the hallmark of pneumonia, um, as has been well studied, is fever and cough. So these are the most um, specific and sensitive signs and symptoms. Um, so, but you also want to consider the etiology. So depending on what is causing the infection, um, the degree, um, duration, and severity of the symptoms can be different. And you also want to think about any extra pulmonary symptoms. Um, so it's important to remember that the location of where the infection is can um, paint a different clinical picture. So for example, upper lobe pneumonias may actually cause radiating neck pain. So it may, especially in, the, in your sicker patients, it may look a little bit similar to meningitis, um, which can be a little scary. And lower lobe pneumonias, as we, I think a lot of us know, may also present with vague abdominal pain. So it may mimic um, a surgical emergency as well. Um, and you want to be able to differentiate between viral and bacterial because, again, that'll have um, a lot of impact on your management. Um, so usually, um, according to studies done, bacterial pneumonia may have a more abrupt or severe onset. Um, they're usually more ill-appearing, and they're usually accompanying toxic effects like moderate um, respiratory distress, chest pain. Um, and you also don't want to miss this diagnosis because there's an increased risk of complications related to viral etiologies. So in terms of diagnosis, um, as we all know and as is published in our guidelines, um, a lot of the times this can be made clinically, especially if the child is well appearing and you have a really good lung exam um, with evidence of a focal consolidation or infiltrate. Um, you don't necessarily need a chest x-ray because it's not really going to change your management. Um, but you can consider doing additional testing or imaging, in particular chest x-ray, if um, you have a suspicion of really severe disease, if there's any hypoxia. Uh, if the child is having significant respiratory distress, you want to make sure to take a look to see what's going on. Um, if your diagnosis is uncertain, um, if you're not able to get a good exam, if the history is not great, um, basically if you have inconclusive clinical findings, this may also help you determine your um, diagnosis and management. You also want to rule out any other causes of respiratory distress that may warrant immediate management. Um, I think a lot of us have probably seen cases where there are two or three things going on at the same time. So um, if the presentation is out of degree, is out of proportion um, to what you're expecting, this might also be a helpful diagnostic management tool. If your child is having prolonged fever and worsening symptoms, despite having already been started on antibiotics that should be appropriately covering uh, what you are suspecting, you definitely want to see what's going on. And um, as well as part of your workup with infant, um, of, of your infant with fever with an obvious source and elevated white blood cell count, this can also be a helpful tool. So outpatient treatment. Um, so anyone less than three months of age, you want to hospitalize. Um, a lot of studies have shown um, a fairly, 
a significantly increased risk of complications in this age group, and they likely require prolonged observation. So that's something you want to think about. Um, in young preschool children who are fully immunized and otherwise healthy, with mild to moderate symptoms, um, we usually start with high dose moxicillin or moxicillin clavulinate. That's usually your first line to cover um, strep pneumo, which is the most common etiology in this age group. In school age children and adolescents with a fairly mild clinical picture, and um, that would make you think about atypical community acquired pneumonia. So that's usually caused by my, um, mycoplasma or chlamydophila. Um, you usually want to start with a macrolid, just azithromycin. And um, there's been a lot of evidence that says that um, in children um, or adolescents with a mild to moderate clinical picture um, consistent with pneumonia, PO antibiotics are as equally effective as IV. So, so another cost-wing controversy, should we treat atypical pneumonia? Pneumonia. Um, there's actually been conflicting studies. Some studies support um, not treating, and some studies support treating. So this is something that I wanted to look at to see if it could be helpful for us. So a Cochrane review done in 2015 um, evaluated whether antibiotics are effective in the treatment of mycoplasma pneumonia, lower respiratory tract infection in children. So they included studies um, comparing antibiotics commonly used for treating this pathogen, um, which includes the macrolids, tetracyclines, and fluoroquinolones. Um, to placebo or antibiotics from any other class in children less than 18 years of age. Um, so again, this was a fairly s a smaller study, um, seven studies, although they had almost 2,000 children enrolled. Um, interestingly, they found that um, the clinical response did not significantly differ between macrolids and non-macrolid groups for community-acquired mycoplasma or respiratory tract infection. Um, and one study found that macrolids are significantly effective compared to um, placebo or um, antibiotics from any other class. So again, um, this was a smaller study and the quality of the evidence was moderate. Um, so what the authors concluded was that there is, not, there is insufficient evidence to determine for sure uh, whether antibiotics are effective for atypical pneumonia caused by mycoplasma pneumonia. Um, but you um, should always individualize your treatment plan based on the patient presentation, um, and you should always weigh the risks against the benefits. What do you guys think? Because <laughs> this is a tough one. If you follow this study, then it would argue against using azithromycin in the school age person, because if it's not going to help, you might as well cover pneumococcus with your amox or augmentin and gamble on the is it, on not getting the macrolide, yeah. if it's if this is the case, because right. azithromycin is not adequate against pneumococcus right. or the other bacterial pathogens, and it's a tough call. You don't know whether you're really dealing with a macrolid. Um, you have all these guesses of they don't look that sick, and maybe they're afebrile, but you hear crackles. So you're saying that's consistent with the walking pneumonia. The X-ray findings again, it's not gospel; it's suggestive. So it's uh, an interesting call. Just a, we need something like uh, like a Leviquin that gets everybody. <laughs> Go wrong. <laughs> yeah. This is this is a tough one. We struggle with this as well for the pneumonia guidelines. So we went with the uh, the radiology hedge of consider. Um, if you notice, that's all over our guidelines. Consider this. Consider that. Me personally, I lean towards treatment. You know, I think it's a little different than <laughs> otitis, where if it goes unchecked, kid's probably going to be fine. But pneumonia, theoretically, if it goes unchecked, could end up uh, not working out so well. So I, I err on the side of treatment. I think also standard of care still hasn't evolved enough to say that we can't. I think some PMDs would probably jump out of their skin if we did not. So. But again, it's, it's really on a case-by-case -case basis. I, I think the big thing with the pneumonias is not to treat pneumonias that are present with wheezing. You know, I think that was a big push because those are usually viral or more reactive, um, as opposed to diffuse crackles where you think it's probably a typical. Just my two cents. Yeah, so as, as we were mentioning, you definitely want to think about the complications, right? Uh, what are the risks of not treating? Um, and then I think it's also good, um, especially in our setting, to have a discussion with the family. Um, I've actually, as, especially as I was preparing for this, I've been able to talk to families a lot about what evidence there is for or against certain treatment strategies. And um, especially if a patient, if a parent is very for or against something, I think it's worth having a conversation about it as well. So. 
Okay, so this is also kind of a term that we coined. Um, so what do we do about the subacute cough? And I think we see this fairly often in our setting. So that cough somewhere between two and four weeks of duration. We are not exactly sure whether it's lingering from an acute cause or whether it's gearing towards a chronic cause. Um, so sinusitis is something that you want to consider, especially in our setting um, in the right season. Um, so sinusitis can present with cough um, and it can um, persist quite a while if it goes untreated. So um, the cough is usually productive and some of the key factors are it's present during the day, but it does tend to get worse at night because of the post-nasal drip. Um, so one of the key factors to diagnosis is to make sure that it's not improving after 10 days, especially after two weeks, um, because that's what really differentiates from being um, from a viral upper respiratory infection. Um, and one of the other um, keys to evaluation after uh, treatment is that it should resolve pretty promptly within 40 to 72 hours once the appropriate therapy is started. Um, and again, the first line treatment for this would be um, Augmentin for 10 days. So the next section we'll be talking about chronic cough, and I think this is one of the most um, common presenting complaints that is very frustrating for me personally. Um, so again, chronic cough is any cough that is longer than four weeks in duration. So that's quite a long time. Um, and as you can see, there are a lot of different etiologies, both pulmonary and non-pulmonary. Um, so our goal is not so much to go through each of these, but more to talk about um, how we can use our history and physical exam. Um, and go through some key pointers that will help us determine the underlying etiology and the best treatment plan. So um, it's important, especially for chronic cough, to differentiate between specific and nonspecific. The reason is that specific chronic cough usually will require further testing and evaluation, whereas nonspecific cough, you do have a couple of management options. So one of the most common causes of nonspecific cough is your post-viral cough. Like we talked about, um, cough with viral URTIs can last up to three weeks. Um, and I think we'll see this fairly commonly, the cough should be tapering off or improving again towards the end of the two to three week duration, and it should resolve spontaneously without any other treatment. Um, studies have shown that this is usually due to um, slow recovery of your epithelial mucosal cells in your airway, as well as um, hypersensitivity of your cough receptors after um, an upper respiratory tract infection. And this can differ depending on the patient. So I think this is also something I like to tell parents, saying that you know, depending on the underlying infection or um, the season or the child, um, the duration of the cough can last anywhere from one to three weeks. So one of our other um, common causes of nonspecific a chronic cough um, is potentially asthma. There's a little bit of controversy about this and it's actually not as commonly seen as I think I thought. Um, so with asthma, you also wanna think about whether there are any other atopic features um, or predisposing risk factors present. So it's something you wanna ask about in your evaluation. Um, and studies have actually shown that um, asthma as a cause of chronic cough, again, more than four weeks in duration, is not common unless you're also seeing wheezing or shortness of breath. So that's something important to remember. Um, if you're suspecting asthma, you can, um, this is one of the cases where you can try something. So you can trial bronchodilator as well as a low dose inhaled corticosteroid like Flovent. Um, you wanna ensure effective administration. So if the child is able to use a spacer, uh, an MDI, you wanna make sure that they're using a spacer. And um, you wanna set a predefined time frame. Um, studies recommend two to four weeks as well as concrete endpoints or goals for your therapy. And then you want to reevaluate in two to four weeks. Again, this is probably most likely done in the primary care setting, but if you happen to have a patient who comes back or you want to have them back for reevaluation, this is something to think about. So um, these are two interesting causes of chronic cough that uh, may not be related to a particular pathophysi pathophysiologic etiology. Um, so there's something called a habit cough. Um, the characteristics of this are a loud repetitive cough with a honking or barking quality, and it's um, notably absent during sleep and during distraction. So this can last weeks, even up to months, and um, some studies show that there may be a preceding viral respiratory infection as a trigger. Um, so this is something important to consider. Um, we'll probably not see it too often, but it is often di misdiagnosed as asthma accrued. So um, if you have a patient coming in with a chronic cough um, with no other suggestive signs or um, symptoms, and they've been kind of repeatedly diagnosed with these etiologies, it's something to think about. Um, and again, the Another key point is that the rest of your exam is normal. There are no other cough pointers that would make you concerned for a specific etiology. 
And again, this is usually a diagnosis of exclusion, so you want to make sure to exclude anything else that um, could potentially warrant treatment or management. Um, and the recommended treatment is actually suggestion therapy, so distraction, um, kind of counseling, um, and potential referral to psychology or psychiatry. And um, almost related is psychogenic cough, so this is more common in your children with generalized anxiety or other symptomatic um, or somatic symptom disorders. Um, and again, the treatment is psychotherapy. So um, these are things, again, uh, we want to think about after excluding other um, causes, but they are something to keep in mind. So another coughing controversy, so um, bronchitis. Uh, the official name is protracted bacterial bronchitis. Um, I think we see this diagnosis fairly often in our community, and um, I see it often as a chief complaint from parents, actually. So um, it's really important to remember that um, the diagnosis of bronchitis requires over four weeks of daily um, productive cough with no other identifiable underlying etiology. So just the, um, statistically speaking, the incidence of this, it's not gonna be high by nature. Um, so that's important to remember. Um, the existence of this etiology was actually initially controversial, but um, several studies over the last 30 years have actually supported its existence. Um, there is a lot of good bronchoscopy data from a study um, in the early 1980s, as well as a study in the early 2000s, both were retrospective studies, um, that showed actual uh, mucal purulent secretions in the airway um, that can lend to definitive diagnosis of this um, etiology. Um, so you'll see this most commonly in children less than six years old, but the studies have shown that you can actually see it in infants, children, and adolescents. And again, the exam is otherwise completely normal with no other pointers um, indicating any other underlying etiology. If you happen to get a chest x-ray, it also may be normal, or you may see some nonspecific peribronchial um, markings. Um, and you can diagnose this clinically. Um, again, you do require over four weeks of daily um, productive cough as well as an otherwise normal exam and no other specific cough pointers, but you can do a definitive diagnosis with sputum culture and bronchoscopy. And the appropriate treatment for this is uh, two to four weeks of um, PO antibiotics. The first line is Augmentin. Uh, the reason for this is that biofilms produced by the bacteria usually do require um, a prolonged course in order for clearance. So. This is a really important slide. You know, we've done, we did some studies last year that we presented at Puck that show that we're overdiagnosing bronchitis. Uh, mainly, probably one is an overdiagnosis of bronchitis in our offices. If, if you see, you know, if you're looking at this, greater than four weeks of cough is going to be extremely rare. You know, again, there may be certain circumstances that fit in, but to meet this criteria means greater than four weeks of daily wet productive cough with no underlying etiology, it's going to be quite rare. Um, but we see it kind of diagnosed pretty regularly, and, and it's one of the big uh, pushes for anti antibiotic stewardship and so on that we're trying to cut down on. Um, also keep in mind, we're seeing a lot of people who are diagnosing bronchitis treating with a Z-Pack, you know, or a seven-day course of Amox, when if you look at this, if you're really going for bronchitis, you're looking at two to four weeks of Augmentin, which is kind of a heavy uh, thing. So just really keep this in mind. If somebody comes in with a couple of weeks of cough and you want to treat, you know, for atypical pneumonia, make that clear or whatever, but bronchitis should be quite rare. Um, hold on. Ready? All right. So uh, this is kind of one of the pet peeves I have in terms of for uh, for peds, um, because there is. I mean, we we've kind of it's sort of like the tonsillitis argument that there's no such thing, but there really is tonsillitis. There really is acute bronchitis. It's just something in in our setting. It's usually a viral illness, so it doesn't require antibiotics. Um, so. When parents come, I mean, we see it in a community where acute bronchitis gets treated. The definition um, that Sun is talking about is more the chronic, chronic bronchitis, which does require antibiotic treatment. But um, I think we, I think we find and we try to, to say that there is no such thing as acute bronchitis, or there's a push that you don't make that diagnosis when it does occur, but it is a viral illness. It doesn't require antibiotics, and we kind of look. I feel you know, kind of look silly when. Um, we say there's no such thing, and someone Googles and goes to a, a website like, um, you know, the Mayo Clinic or a, 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 a good clinical website, and they, there is a definition of acute bronchitis there. So I think we need to differentiate, not, not say it doesn't occur in children, but it occurs in children, we just don't need to treat it.
Good point. Good point. Any, any other questions on bronchitis, comments? And um, just to explain more about the treatment, your most common etiologies are going to be strep pneumo, um, hemophilus, and morixella, which is why you want to use the augmentin. Um, so another coughing controversy. So these are actually controversial causes of chronic cough. Uh, what I mean by that is that there is not enough evidence to really support these as common causes in the pediatric population. Um, so GERD, I've also seen this kind of um, from parents or diagnosed by PMDs. Um, so this is um, inconclusive as to whether this is a true etiology of chronic cough or whether it's significant enough to warrant further treatment. Um, so guidelines recommend um, not routinely treating or trialing with reflux medications. Um, Post nasal drip as well. Um, we talked about kind of our causes of subacute cough and to consider sinusitis as something um, that you want to consider when you do have cough for two weeks of duration. Um, but just post nasal drip from allergic rhinitis or viral sinusitis, um, it shouldn't really last as long as chronic cough does. So you shouldn't really be seeing it more than four weeks. Um, and you can really use your history here. Um, get some key points, other allergic signs or symptoms, look at the season, um, family history, any other predisposing factors. And again, they don't routinely recommend um, allergy testing, although um, you can certainly trial allergy medications. So in terms of your evaluation, what are our goals? Um, we want to think about whether the child has an underlying chronic lung disease or pulmonary etiology that would require further workup um, and possible referral. Um, we want to think about whether there are any therapies or medications that are warranted because this would definitely change our management. Um, and are there any other modifiable factors that are exacerbating the cough that we can potentially exclude or help the family exclude? Um, what is the psychosocial impact or kind of the burden of the cough on the child and the family? This is really important to consider as we talked about before. Um, and then make sure to kind of tease out what the family's expectations are for your evaluation as well as your treatment and what they're expecting kind of the progression or the course to be. So um, key things in the history, um, again, you do want to you want to clarify the nature of the cough, whether it's productive or non-productive, um, as well as um, getting some key characteristics of the cough that can lend you towards diagnosis. So um, if you have a brassy or a barking cough, you can think about croup, um, even habit cough. If you have a paroxysmal cough, especially with a whoop, right, you want to think about pertussis. Um, not commonly seen, but it's also something you want to think about. Um, although certain viral illnesses can also cause a cough like this. Um, staccato cough in infants, you want to talk about chlamydia, um, and then if you see a honking cough, again, you want to think about the habit or psychogenic cough like we talked about. So um, just getting some of those key characteristics or even hearing the child cough can be helpful in determining your etiology. Um, and then you want to um, ask about duration, right? You want to clarify whether this cough is acute or truly chronic. Um, you want to ask about any aggravating factors, relieving factors, think about things in the environment that could potentially be contributing. Um, and then ask about diurnal variation. Is it present all throughout the day? Um, is it worse at night? Is it only at night, worse in the morning? That can also help you um, figure out the etiology. Um, any other associated symptoms? Again, a lot of causes of chronic cough are pulmonary, but as we saw on the slide before, there are non-pulmonary causes. So you want to think about whether there's anything else going on outside of the pulmonary system. Um, and then again, specific cough pointers are really um, important to ask about. So these include wheezing, um, shortness of breath, chest pain, hemoptysis, um, whether there was any recent history of choking, um, anything, again, that can lead you towards a specific etiology that would require further workup and management. So um, this is the rest of the history that you want to go through. Um, any other medical problems, right? Whether there have been respiratory issues or significant neonatal history. Um, environmental exposures, tobacco and polyutens being the most important, uh, as well as easily modifiable. Uh, medication, some of them can have side effects. Um, your most notable is ACE inhibitors. We're not gonna see a ton of patients on this, but uh, one of the most common, one of the most prominent symptom, uh, side effects is cough. So you wanna ask about that. Um, social history, um, whether, you know, what kind of impact the cough is having, um, whether the child is in daycare, um, any other exposures. And then especially with the recent rise of vaping, I think that's something we also wanna ask our um, adolescent or young adult patients. Um, family history, again, if there's any predisposing risk factors for certain etiologies. And you also want to ask about travel or immigration history, um, especially with um, things like tuberculosis that we may not see commonly locally or in the U.S. Um, if someone has recently come from somewhere else where it's endemic, um, it's definitely a common cause of chronic cough. 
Um, and this is really important. Just ask about parental expectations like we were talking about. Um, ask about what the parents think it is, what they're concerned about, um, you know, what they've seen before. I think this can also be really helpful in determining our treatment plan. So your exam, you just want a good, a good thorough physical exam. Um, it, it'll be one of the, your most important diagnostic tools, um, especially for chronic cough or where you're not sure exactly what's going on. So vital signs are really important. Um, you also want to look at their general appearance, see if they've been growing and developing well, because that can also lead you to any specific etiologies. Um, and again, consider all systems, especially for chronic cough or cough um, that has sought recurrent consultation. Um, you want to see if there's anything else um, other than the lungs that um, may be, um, that may, that something else that may be going on other than um, pulmonary. Um, you also want to get a really good chest exam, pretty straightforward. Um, ask the child to cough if the child is old enough, just to have an idea of any specific characteristics or qualities. Uh, inspect the chest wall. Um, some chest wall deformities or their structural pathologies can cause um, cough or especially chronic cough. Um, you want to auscultate really well, look for any other specific cough pointers, and palpation as well can be helpful. So initial testing. Um, your standard initial tests will be chest x-ray and spirometry. Um, since we do not do spirometry in our offices, I'll focus mostly on the chest x-ray. Um, so two important things to consider. How is this going to affect your treatment plan? Is it going to change your management? If it doesn't, um, consider refraining from getting it and definitely have that discussion with the family. Um, and I think this is something that we see fairly often. Um, what does the family expect? Did they come in just to get a chest x-ray? Did their pediatrician send them for a chest x-ray? I think that's also really important to figure out and discuss. Um, so for acute cough, getting a chest x-ray is usually not indicated. Um, but when it's required would be, again, when your diagnosis is uncertain, um, if you're having persistent or worsening symptoms despite adequate treatment or observation, if you're suspecting aspiration of foreign body that's causing sy symptoms and would require um, urgent evaluation and management, or you're having an atypical clinical course, especially with any specific cough pointers that are concerning. Um, chronic cough, I think, um, is usually a good reason for getting a chest x-ray just to figure out what's going on. And um, again, just remember that a normal chest x-ray does not exclude pulmonary disease. So referral, um, when should we refer? Um, again, when your diagnosis is uncertain, especially with chronic cough, if you're really not sure what's going on and you think the child needs additional testing, you should always refer to pulmonology. Um, chronic cough, you'll usually end up referring just because the duration is quite long. Again, there's a significant burden on the families and you don't want to miss any etiologies that could lead to complications. Um, specific cough in particular is where you're definitely going to be referring sooner rather than later. If there's some sort of underlying etiology, such as bronchiectasis, um, or where the child may need bronchoscopy, you definitely want to send them soon. Um, again, if there's any indication for additional testing, this is usually done best by a pediatric pulmonologist, so you want to send them. Um, if there's any potential for urgent management um, that a pulmonologist would be able to do, or a possible ENT, and again, talk to the family. Um, see what their expectations are. If they're very frustrated, if you're, you, the PMD, are not sure what's going on, I think referral might be a good option. So um, we went through some of the management, especially for our more common causes of acute and chronic cough, but um, things to consider. You always want to target treatment. Um, rather than kind of trialing this, trialing that, um, you want to make sure to figure out what's going on and try to do um, what might be best for that underlying etiology. Um, let's figure out any exacerbating factors, help the family identify and alleviate those. And then you want to figure out what kind of effects the cough is having on the family, um, just to see what, how much of a burden it is and how urgent some things need to be done. Um, again, go through family expectations. Remember supportive care, right? For most of your causes of acute cough, this will be the mainstay. Um, avoid cold and cough medications, particularly opioids. There have been a lot of studies, including in that Cochrane study, that showed that opioids um, are associated with the um, most significant and highest rate of adverse effects. Uh, avoid any environmental exposures. Um, so consider honey and alternative therapies, right? If they don't have significant harm and they can be of benefit, I think it's not um, a bad tool to have in your toolbox. Um, watchful waiting is also a really good option. Um, even in our setting, you can have patients come back um, just to see and reevaluate. Um, you can consider medication trials primarily for asthma or bronchodilators. Um, and then again, reevaluate and refer when needed. So I just wanted to um, conclude with um, a brief overview of a study that I did um, for my fellow project. 
Um, so I basically conducted a survey, it was question-based, um, assessing the, uh, our provider's practices in the management of pediatric illnesses presenting with cough. Um, so we, I got about um, 100 or so responses, um, and we found that the majority of providers do adhere to standard of care or evidence-based practices for most of our common pediatric respiratory illnesses. Um, but we did find, interestingly, that there was greater variation in uh, management practices when cough was present for two weeks or more. Um, so this is one of the main reasons why I wanted to um, talk about this topic as well. And I can show you some data that we have. So um, these are just charts um, assessing all the responses. So I presented um, clinical scenarios that led you to a diagnosis and um, the providers were asked to um, respond with what they thought was going on as well as any and all treatment options. So if you can see, um, for most of the conditions all across the board, um, there was little variation in how our providers would manage illnesses. Uh, but when we presented a case with um, a viral upper respiratory tract infection with two weeks of cough, um, we did see a little more variation in how um, providers would manage. So um, we did see a little more um, use of chest X-ray, uh, trial of bronchodilators, and a significantly increased use of antibiotics, primarily because providers were suspecting bacterial etiologies at this point. Any questions about this data? It looks like the biggest thing is that once the cough gets above two weeks, we're all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, like we were mentioning before, um, I think I personally was not aware that acute cough can last up to two weeks or that chronic cough qualifies as duration of four. So even when I was seeing patients with duration of 10 to 14 days, you know, my threshold for considering bacterial etiologies or other etiologies that would require management was much lower. But I think after going through this data, I realized, oh, you know, even post-viral cough can last up to three weeks. So uh, I think just that overview is helpful. So um, just some take-home points. Um, again, cough lasting over four weeks is what we consider chronic. Um, you can make a good, you can usually make your diagnosis with a really good history and physical. Um, always, always consider family expectations as well as the burden on the family. Um, when you have a subacute cough and it's not improving, consider sinusitis. Um, again, we should avoid over-the-counter cough medications. There is um, sufficient evidence to support that. And um, alternative therapies just honey may also be effective. Um, and atypical pneumonia, we had this discussion, but consider treating, especially in our setting. Um, and again, the diagnosis of pediatric bacterial or chronic bronchitis um, requires um, daily productive cough for over four weeks, so it's not something that we're going to be diagnosing commonly. Um, again, we really rarely need additional testing for acute cough, um, but for chronic cough, consider um, further evaluation, um, starting with a chest X-ray and possible referral. Okay, any questions? Um, for pediatric bronchitis, do those guidelines apply to like the adolescent population that we see too, like over 15 or so, in terms of like acute versus chronic and waiting the four weeks before treating, and is it still augmented versus azithro? Yeah, that's a good question. So the studies that I looked at, um, the retrospective studies where they had the actual bronchoscopy data, they looked at um, infants six months to 18 years of age. Okay. So it technically does qualify for adolescents. I'm not exactly sure about the young adult population because I wasn't able to find um, evidence for that. But uh, up to 18 years old, I think um, all of those qualify. So. Oh, no. Yeah, I think the one, the one difference I'll do in adolescence is I'm a little bit more willing to treat for sinus. Um, if they, and you'll see this in my upcoming lecture, if they have significant facial pain, they've had it before, you know, I'll do watch and wait or so on, but they tend to get more of like the really painful sinusitis versus the little kids that have more of like the protracted URI symptoms and so on. I guess with the older ones, just addressing what you said and chiming in, um, you have to think about if they're smoking because uh, they're going to be more likely to have, uh, I think, potentially for a bacterial uh, bronchitis, as well as kids with cystic or adolescents with cystic fibrosis, mm -hmm. they more commonly. So any chronic lunger, you have to sort of weigh in on, do I think they're 
mucus stasis and their underlying um, pathology, pathophysiology is contributing more to a potential bacterial bronchitis. Yeah, absolutely.